In this next subsection, we're going to look at the brainstem. We'll start with the medulla oblongata, which is connected to the spinal cord. Uh, we'll look at the pons and then the midbrain and then something called the reticular formation, which travels throughout the brainstem. And then um, we'll look at the cerebellum and its functions. So according to Paul McLean's triune brain hypothesis, this is the R-complex, the brainstem, uh, the reptilian brain, and it sort of is the seat of all of our basic unconscious life activities and instinctual drive and impulses and whatnot. Uh, one way to think about the brainstem is that it really is the linking point between the spinal cord and the brain. Uh, so we're going to see that in the brainstem, there's actually two uh, types of tracts of nerves. One tract are what we call descending fibers. So in the brain, in the cortex, there's a region, we'll look at this later, called the primary motor cortex. And that's where there are nerve cells that uh, the cell bodies of these nerve cells reside. And in these nerve cells, when they fire, they are going to initiate motor activity and specific muscles in the body. And the way that happens is that neurons come down uh, from these centers. They're going to actually go through the brainstem and they're going to go along the front side of the brainstem. These are called descending motor fibers. And so they're going to go that way. And then coming up from the body are our sensory impressions. And they're going to come up what are called ascending tracks up the back of the brainstem. And they're actually, some of them are going to be mapped into the region called the thalamus. And then from there, they might make their way up into what's called the primary uh, somatosensory cortex up in the cerebrum. So we'll be looking at those pathways. But basically the uh, brainstem is the paths down and up. Scattered throughout the brainstem additionally are what are called nuclei. And these are, remember, clusters of nerve cell bodies. Um, and they have different functions. So there are nuclei that really regulate breathing and uh, cardiovascular function like blood pressure and heart rate. There's vomiting centers, there's uh, swallowing centers, and then there are the nuclei of the 12 cranial nerves. So remember the cranial nerves come, and come off almost like tentacles off of the brainstem here, and their nuclei, where the nerve starts, is actually found uh, in these nuclei. The cell bodies of where the nerve starts is found in the nuclei within the brainstem. So we'll see the um, 10 out of the 12 cranial nerves actually start there. Cranial nerve number one is the olfactory nerve and it has sort of a, its own unique pathway. And then cranial number two, nerve number two is the optic nerve and it's gonna actually go higher. Uh, but two of the 10 cranial nerves begin uh, in the brainstem and they send projections outward. So we'll be looking at each layer of the brainstem, the medulla, the pons, and then the midbrain and look at which tracts are found there and then which nuclei are found in those regions. And then we'll finally look at the cerebellum which is sort of stuck behind. It's actually attached to the brainstem in three areas. These are called the uh, cerebellar peduncles. Um, and that allows nerve fibers from the brainstem to reach the cerebellum and back. So think of it like a secondary processing center important for motor uh, regulation, like balance and coordination. So when you learn how to ride a bike or play the piano, it's uh, those motor movements are sort of unconscious and that's regulated highly by the cerebellum center for okay so let's look first at the medulla oblongata also just known as the medulla or an older ner uh, name for it was called the bulb um, it's continuous with the spinal cord and it, uh, at the foramen magnum so that's the hole in the skull at the base of the spine um, it has its own blood supply and that comes from branches off of the vertebral artery and the uh, anterior spinal artery and what's called the posterior inferior cerebellar, cerebellar artery. And I'm not gonna make you memorize all that. Um, these are uh, basically aspects off the vertebral artery and the basal artery that are going to supply the, most of the brainstem, but in this case, the medulla. And again, where this is important is the specific lesions, uh, thrombi, which are blood clots or hemorrhages or whatnot along that blood supply can disrupt specific regions of the body, in this case, the medulla. And as, we see, as we'll see in the neurology sections, um, uh, lesions of the blood supplies that, su that supply the brainstem usually have very severe neurological consequences and could be fatal uh, because this is really where a lot of your autonomic functions like breathing and heart rate, blood pressure, sleep-wake cycles, etc. are regulated from. Um, so if we look at the medulla, there's uh, if we look at the front side, the uh, anterior or ventral, again this would be towards the front of the body, um, we see a couple of different structures there. 
One are the medullary pyramids. Uh, so here's a picture. So here, first of all, is again the orientation. Here's the medulla down here. Um, and then at the, if we look at the medulla on top of it is the pons. That's this blue part here. And then we have these sort of uh, rising projections that come out the front. Uh, they're called the medullary pyramids. And what these are essentially are really the places where all those motor fibers coming down from the cortex are going to come down and they're actually going to cross and go down the spinal cord. And so from this side of the body, it's going to come down and then across. And that crossing is called decussation. So the decussation of the pyramids is where these motor fibers cross from left to right. And there are two major types of motor tracts that come down. One are the cortical spinal tracts. And these are the motor neurons for the uh, torso and your limbs, your legs and your arms. Uh, uh, and then the cortical bulbar tracts are motor neurons to your cranial nerves. So that's what helps regulate your cranial nerves, which, which uh, modulate, for example, your facial muscles, your muscles of chewing, uh, your eye movements, all that kind of thing. So that is the cortical bulbar tracts. Cortical bulbar are really technically all the motor neurons innervating the cranial nerves that do not involve the eye or what we call ocular motor movements. Um, okay, so that's the two major motor tracts and their decussation. Uh, only about 50% of the cortical bulbar tracts decussate or cross, but most of the cortical spinal tracts cross here at the medulla. And then alongside these um, pyramids, are the, they look like little olive structures and they're actually called the olives, medullary olives. And they contain uh, clusters of cell bodies called the inferior olivary nucleus. And this really uh, receives input from the spinal cord as well as from the cerebral cortex, the midbrain and so forth. And um, it actually helps regulate unconscious motor uh, impulses. It actually helps send some of these motor impulses to the cerebellum. Uh, via what's called the inferior cerebellar peduncle. So that's the connecting point of the cerebellum with the medulla. We'll look at that here in just a second. All right, so that's the front side, the anterior or ventral medulla. Um, I should also say that in that anterior part are the nuclei for four cranial nerves. Um, so we have cranial nerve nine through 12, um, and we'll look at their functions here in just a moment. So four cranial nerves originate in the medulla. There's actually a fifth that has partial origin there, but um, these are the four primary ones. Um, so if you look at the posterior side, it's hard to see because the cerebellum is covering it, but if you cut the cerebellum and peel it open, at the upper end of the medulla, uh, so that would be in this region here, uh, is actually, oh, I'm sorry, be down here, sorry, this is the pons right here. So this is the medulla here. Um, the upper part actually contains the, um, uh, floor the fourth ventricle. So that's the fourth ventricle. And then on either side of that is the inferior cerebellar peduncle. And that's what connects the uh, motor tracts in the medulla to the uh, cerebellum. And so they're what we call transverse fibers going back and forth. Um, and then if you look at the lower part of the medulla, it closes up. So the ventricle actually becomes closed up and it actually drains into what's called the central canal into the spinal cord. Um, so we can really uh, differentiate an upper from a lower medulla based on that. Uh, but basically the posterior medulla contains the sensory tracts. So these are ascending uh, from the body and uh, they're going to bring the sensory information. In particular, there is what's called the posterior column medial lemniscus pathway. This is your major sensory path for fine touch vibration, two-point discrimination, and proprioception, which is your balance muscle orientation. Um, so the tracks come up the spinal cord. They actually synapse onto neurons in the medulla. These are called second order, order, order neurons, and they form what's called the medial lemniscus pathway, and we'll see that later. That's gonna carry information from the medulla up to the brain, up to the cerebrum, to the somatosensory cortex that I pointed out earlier. Um, so that is the sensory, one example of the sensory pathways that come up. Um, there's also, again, I mentioned the peduncle, which connects the cerebellum with the, and that's right here, the inferior cerebellar pe peduncle. It's actually, it kind of forms this big cluster with the middle 
peduncle and the superior, but basically the inferior connects fibers from the medulla to the cerebellum. The middle cerebellar peduncle connects fibers from the pons to the cerebellum, and the superior connects fibers from the midbrain to the uh, cerebellum. <clears throat> so this is how the cerebellum is able to communicate with the different parts of the brainstem. Uh, here's another picture of just some of these cranial nerves and uh, them coming out here. So you can see very clearly the olives here. Um, here are the pyramids. And then we can see various nerves, the hypoglossal nerve, the accessory nerve, the vagus nerve, and the glossal pharyngeal. So we'll look at those. And then the pons has its own cranial nerves that come out, and the big one here being trigeminal. But uh, we'll look at that in the is coming up here and then to the right here we see a picture of the motor pathway so these are again the motor neurons begin up in the brain in the cerebrum and then they project down through something called the internal capsule they enter the brain stem and this is along the anterior or front side and then they cross at the medulla that's the decusation and then they go down the spinal cord and then they synapse onto another neuron which goes out to a muscle so when we talk about motor neurons, we'll, talk, we'll differentiate what's called a lower motor neuron uh, versus an upper motor neuron. So all these in the brain and brain stem are, and uh, spinal cord are upper motor neurons, and lower motor neurons connect to the muscles. And so we'll see diseases, uh, disorders like ALS actually affect the motor neuron specifically, and they cause destruction of the nerves along these pathways. Uh, the clinical signs and symptoms of upper motor neuron versus loader, lower motor neuron diseases are different too. And so we'll look at that in the neurology section. Okay, so that's a little bit about the structure of the uh, medulla. So in the last slide, we looked at the tracts of the medulla. Here we'll look at some of the nuclei. And so in the anterior part of the medulla, we have nuclei that regulate a lot of autonomic uh, functions. So we have a cardiovascular and vasomotor center, which regulates heart rate and contraction. So it's actually getting input in the body from different chemoreceptors and baroreceptors, which are pressure receptors. And that's helping to regulate via the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetics, your blood pressure and so forth. There's a respiratory center, and there's actually two portions to that, what's called the dorsal and the ventral center, and that's gonna either speed up or slow down your breathing, um, and it's gonna work with centers in the pons uh, to regulate that. The dorsal centers usually inhibit the breathing, and then the ventral stimulates it. Um, and this is gonna regulate the rate, rhythm, and depth of breathing. Uh, interestingly, we'll see with breathing, the primary signal that tells the body to take a breath is not low oxygen in the blood as you would suspect, but it's actually high carbon dioxide. So what triggers respiration is CO2, not oxygen, um, at least not in the, the earlier phases uh, of hypoxia. Um, we have a vomiting center and uh, this causes vomiting. Um, and this is actually um, uh, up against the backside here of the fourth ventricle. Um, and this is actually sensing the cerebral spinal fluid. So if it senses things in there that uh, it doesn't like, it's gonna trigger the vomiting uh, uh, action through your nervous system to try to vomit up what you might be absorbing from your intestines. And then there's a deglutination center. This is a swallowing, sneezing, coughing, hiccuping center. Um, so that, those are all nuclei found in the anterior medulla. On the posterior side, again, we have the sensory nuclei, and that's where the fibers coming up the spinal cord as part of the posterior column are going to synapse onto second order uh, order neurons to form the medial lumniscus which then goes up to the cerebral cortex um, okay and then scattered throughout we have cranial nerve nuclei of four primary cranial nerves so the glossal pharyngeal nerve cranial nerve number nine this regulates taste and swallowing and salivation the vagus nerve, which is your primary parasympathetic nerve, uh, also in the face and the head and neck regulates the pharynx and the larynx. Uh, and then, of course, all your abdominal and thoracic viscera, um, like your heart and your lungs and your intestines. And then we have cranial nerve number 11, the accessory nerve involved in swallowing. And then a hypoglossal nerve, cranial nerve number 12, which regulates the tongue. So these are your four cranial nerves that originate from the uh, uh, brainstem, from the medulla. The functions of the medulla are to essentially then control rest uh, ventilation through the dorsal and ventral respiratory centers working with the pons. We'll see that in just a second. Uh, 
regulating blood pressure, heart rate, um, and then a vasomotor center works via baroreceptors in the body. These are pressure receptors in your arteries um, that's gonna regulate um, your blood pressure. And then reflex centers for vomiting, coughing, sneezing, swallowing. So problems of the cranial nerve nuclei, and that can come from strokes, lesions that cause strokes that affect those regions, uh, or maybe a tumor growing there or something, can cause what's called bulbar palsy. And that refers to a range of different signs and symptoms linked to impairment of the function of those four cranial nerves. And that can occur from um, any of these motor neuron lesions, actually these would be upper, upper or lower. So uh, again, the motor neurons are coming down from the cerebrum and then crossing over onto secondary neurons going down. So we sometimes say they're lower uh, motor neurons relatively to the upper ones. But basically the motor neurons that go down the medulla, if they're damaged, um, that can result in symptoms of uh, difficulty swallowing, uh, difficulty speaking, that would be dysphonia or dysarthria. Uh, difficulty swallowing would be dysphagia. Uh, dysarthria specifically a slow, kind of slurred, difficult speech. Uh, difficulty chewing, uh, nasal regurgitation, aspiration of liquids. This would all be part of bulbar palsy. Remember the bulb is an old name for the medulla. Uh, there's another syndrome called Wallenberg syndrome, and this happens from a stroke of the posterior inferior cere uh, cerebellar artery, and that can cause nystagmus, which is a rapid back and forth flicking, flickering of the eyes, uh, especially when you look to the side. Uh, vertigo, uh, dysarthria, again, difficulty, slow, uh, slurred speech, hoarseness, and then difficulty swallowing, dysphagia. Uh, loss on the same side of the body, ipsilateral, uh, to pain and temperature in the face, but contralateral to the trunk and extremities. Uh, and that's because of the crossing over the fibers. And then ipsilateral, same side, Horner syndrome. That has to do with um, damage to sympathetic nerves, which regulate the eyelid, causing eyelid drooping, regulate the iris, which causes uh, dilation of the eye of the iris, and then um, inhibition of sweating on that side of the face. I think I said one thing incorrectly, meiosis is actually the constriction of the pupil. Midriasis is the dilation of the pupil. So we have pupillary constriction, eyelid droop, and loss of sweat. And why this is important is that people that present with all these particular neurological symptoms, the neurologist can quickly uh, determine that, yeah, this is probably from a stroke here affecting the medulla via occlusion of that artery, and then imaging can confirm that. I will not uh, be asking you to memorize Wallenberg syndrome. Uh, just know that it does happen from inclusion of the artery, but do understand a little bit about bulbar palsy and what that might mean. Um, all right, so we have descending motor tracts, cortical spinal, cortical bulbar tracts through the medullary pyramids, and then the olives kind of help regulate that. We have the ascending sensory tracts, especially through the dorsal columns, which regulate the fine touch and conscious proprioception, vibration sense, etc. Uh, and then we have a number of nuclei, four cranial nerve nuclei, cranial nerves uh, 9 through 12. And then we have a bunch of those regulatory centers for breathing and uh, cardiovascular regulation, then the swallowing centers, vomiting centers, etc. So those, that's uh, kind of all you really need to know at this stage about the medulla. Next, we jump to the pons. In Latin, pons means bridge. And so this bridge is essentially the uh, medulla with the higher centers of the midbrain. Uh, it's pretty easy to recognize the pons has this bulge-like appearance uh, when looking from the side. Um, and these are, again, containing descending motor fibers, just like we have in the medulla. So the ventral basilar pons is the descending motor fibers. Uh, so both cortical spinal and cortical bulbar tracts. There are also what are called pontine nuclei, and these are synaptic relay stations between the, um, those motor tracts from the cerebrum and the cerebellum. So that's gonna go out through the middle cere cerebellar peduncle. That's where the uh, nerves from the pons go out to the cerebellum back and forth. So there's gonna be connections transverse this way. So there's gonna be a descending fiber coming down and then this is going down towards the spinal cord. And then there are transverse fibers going to and fro the cerebellum. And the pontine nuclei are kind of uh, helping to regulate that. Okay, so that's the ventral pons. Um, and then the dorsal pons, uh, 
Um, this uh, contains the ascending sensory fibers, again similar to the medulla, but again there's lots of now transverse fibers that's different than the medulla going to and fro the cerebellum. And then there are cranial nerve nuclei of four cranial nerves, and that's cranial nerve five through eight. And I'll review here in just a second what those do. And then there's respiratory centers, the what's called the pneumotaxic and apneustic areas, and they help regulate breathing movements in conjunction with the dorsal respiratory group of the medulla. So that's gonna help either speed up, or in this case, usually these work to slow down breathing. And that's gonna change the blood pH because as you retain carbon dioxide, your blood acidity actually goes up. And then as you exhale, your blood acidity goes down. So this is um, gonna help regulate breathing movements, partly to regulate the pH and CO2 and whatnot. Uh, there's also in the dorsal pons, and I should say this area of the pons is also called the pontine tegmentum. So tegmentum just refers to the backside. Um, but uh, the tegmentum here also contains what's called the RAF nucleus. And these are actually the cell bodies of serotonin secreting neurons. So most of your serotonin in the brain comes from this region, uh, the RAF nucleus. And then the neurons actually, the axons ascend the brainstem and they go up and then they synapse onto all different parts of the limbic system and uh, the cortex. So that's the origin of your serotoninergic neurons is the RAF nucleus. Drugs like SSRIs are thought primarily to work at that region. Um, and then locus ceruleus is another region here in the dorsal pons, and that contains norepinephrine secreting neurons. And then finally, there is what's called the sleep paralysis center, so that when you're in REM sleep, rapid eye movement, your eyes are darting back and forth. If you wake people up during REM sleep, they usually say they've been dreaming. Um, but this part of the pons inhibits your descending motor fibers, so essentially you have paralysis of the body. Uh, it's called sleep paralysis. And uh, that's probably a good thing because otherwise you'd thrash around all night and hurt yourself or others. Um, but some people actually wake up in that state and they find they can't move their body for a little while until that center comes back online. So that can cause all sorts of night terrors and, and whatnot. Um, so that's the dorsal pons uh, and some of the nuclei that it contains. Here's just a cross section of the pons. Again, I won't be asking you to label all these things, but this is the anterior side here, and this is the dorsal side. Um, so the dorsal side is actually right up against the fourth ventricle here. Um, that's what the four comes in. Um, and then the anterior side is what contains the cortical spinal tract. So these are those descending motor fibers. And then your backside here contains the uh, neuron uh, the axons from your sensory fibers that are ascending from the medial lemniscus pathway and then we have the RAF nucleus again the serotonergic neurons and let's see locus ceruleus which is also depicted here uh, that's your norepinephrine secreting neurons again they ascend to different parts of the brain and they're super involved with things like attention and uh, concentration and things like that so uh, as we'll see in the psychiatry section, there are medications that can either affect the serotonin pathways, those are the, like the SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or some of them affect the norepinephrine secreting pathways, that's the SNRIs, um, selective uh, norepinephrine uh, reuptake inhibitors, and they uh, partly affect the locus ceruleus. Um, one of the cranial nerves, the biggest cranial nerve that comes out of one of the four that comes out of the pons is the trigeminal nerve. And so you see its uh, nuclei here. Trigeminal has both a sensory and a motor portion. So there's different nuclei for each and they go back and forth through the trigeminal nerve. Trigeminal nerve actually then synapses onto a ganglia on either side of the face, just by the ear. And then from there, there are three primary pathways um, that innervate your face. So the main thing that trigeminal does is your sensory to the face. Um, so when you touch your face or have any sensations, uh, that's involving the trigeminal nerve. The motor portion of the trigeminal nerve in, uh, it innervates your uh, chewing muscles, muscles of mastication. Um, trigeminal neuralgia is inflammation of the trigeminal nerve and that causes excruciating pain along one of those pathways. And then interestingly, when you get uh, herpes, oral herpes infections, the herpes virus actually is able to enter the nerve, remember, and then through retrograde transport, travels back and lives in one of those trigeminal ganglia by the ear. 
And for whatever reason, if your immune system is low, you're under stress, that virus can then erupt again down that through uh, anterogate transport, deliver viral particles to the end of the neuron, which then erupts through the skin. Um, but it only erupts through one of the branches, usually of the trigeminal nerve. Usually people don't have infections along all three branches. Um, it's particularly dangerous when the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal, the one around the eye, uh, gets infected because that can affect the cornea and that can cause uh, serious eye complications. Um, usually it's the lower branches or the middle branches that get infected and so we get outbreaks on the lips or the nose or areas like that. Um, okay, so these are some of the nuclei and tracts here in the uh, pons. I mentioned there are four cranial nerves, uh, nuclei in the pond. So I've just talked about the trigeminal and it has sensory to the face. Uh, and then the motor aspect is chewing. The abducens nerve is cranial nerve number six. This is one of the three muscles that controls the eyeball. Uh, so this involves uh, eyeball movement, especially lateral eyeball movement. Um, there's no sensory portion to the abducens, it's just motor. The facial nerve, uh, cranial nerve number seven, uh, it's, we usually think of this one as your primary motor nerve to the face. So the muscles that control smiling and frowning and all your facial expressions are regulated by cranial nerve number seven. It also regulates uh, saliva secretion and tearing. Uh, so, you know, making more saliva, crying, all that, this is regulated by the facial nerve. And then there's a sensory portion which is involved in taste to the tongue. Um, so that's the facial nerves, and um, you've probably heard of something called Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy affects the facial nerve and causes paralysis of the nerve. Uh, we think, we don't really know what causes it. The speculation is often a virus that does this, uh, another herpes type virus. Um, and um, that basically then the muscles of the face droop and, and your eyelid droops and things like that. Um, most cases resolve within a couple of months, but some linger on. So that's uh, uh, cranial nerve number seven, the facial nerve. And then finally, cranial nerve number eight. This has both sensory and motor. Uh, this regulates both your vestibular apparatus, um, which is uh, involved in balance, as well as hearing. So this is, we usually think of this as uh, mostly equilibrium and balance. Um, so that's cranial nerve number eight. Um, so obviously any uh, pathology to the pons could affect those cranial nerves and then affect all the functions. So if you look at the functions, it's a loss of uh, pons activity, you'll see functions lost from any of those cranial nerves. And then problems maybe with sleep, uh, with respiration, swallowing, bladder control, hearing, equilibrium, taste, eye movement, facial expressions, facial sensations, and posture. So these are, again, functions regulated by these four cranial nerves, uh, as well as the respiratory centers that are in the pons. One other condition I'll just mention is something called central pontine myel myelinolysis. Uh, so this is essentially when the descending motor neurons that go through the pons, the basilar pons, demyelinate. And the most common reason for that is chronic alcoholism or uh, rapid correction of low blood sodium. That's called hyponatremia. Natrium is the Latin word for sodium. Um, so if people have low sodium in the blood on a blood test and they get a rapid infusion of saline, salt, uh, sodium chloride, that can cause uh, the central pontine myelinolysis. And what happens is if you lose the myelin around the cortical spinal and cortical bulbar tracts, that results essentially in muscle paralysis throughout the body. And it's spastic, your muscles start to spasm and you get... Um, essentially palsy of all of the uh, bulbar functions that we already talked about, and then mental changes. And this could progress to a permanent condition called locked-in syndrome, where a person is fully conscious, they sense everything, but have no motor function in the body. Horrible condition. Um, but that's uh, due to loss of the myelin around the neurons uh, in the basilar pons. Okay, so that's a little bit about the pons. Next, we'll look at the midbrain. So the midbrain is going to connect the pons to the higher brain structures. Um, so in the diagram here, the midbrain is sitting on top of the pons. Um, and it's really the gateway to the limbic system and the cortex. Um, there's four regions. The dorsal side, the back side, is called the tectum. And uh, that's actually going to contain the cerebral aqueduct uh, 
So the aqueduct is the pathway between the third ventricle here and the fourth ventricle down here that the cerebral spinal fluid is going to flow. So it's going to actually flow through the back side of the midbrain. And then the ventral side is called the tegmentum. So in this particular picture, the tegmentum is really all of this area in here. And the tectum is this backside. And then we have the aqueduct. And then the fourth structure are called the cerebral peduncles, and that's these regions here. And the peduncles um, are going to be really where a lot of the motor fibers, again, the descending motor fibers from the cortical spinal tract and whatnot are going down. Um, the blood supply here is through the posterior cerebral artery and the, um, the superior cerebellar artery and then branches off of the basilar artery. I should mention the pons, I didn't mention that, but the pons really gets most of its blood supply from the basilar artery, from what are called the little pontine arteries. They look like little hairs that come off of the basilar artery. Um, again, probably more detail than you need to know at this point, but uh, just to give you some orientation. Um, the cerebral, don't get this confused with cerebellar, but the cerebral peduncles are these little extensions off the front of the, of the midbrain. And uh, this is, again, all of your voluntary descending motor tracts from the cortical spinal and cortical bulbar tracts go through this region. Um, so let's, let's jump to the tectum at the back. If you look at the tectum, it actually has these four these little enlargements and these are called the colliculi and if you look at them let me scan down to this picture here if you look at the colliculi this is looking from the back side with the cerebellum removed um, you get you see these four little bulbs and these are all at the back side of the midbrain and so we have two that are on top we call those the superior colliculi and then two down here that's called the inferior colliculi uh, notice that the pituitary gland, which is coming from the back side of the thalamus up above, sticks right in here. So it forms a really interesting, looks like four chambers of the heart with the pituitary sticking down there. These are, of course, solid, the colliculi, and they contain uh, nuclei that regulate, in the case of the superior colliculi, your tracking movements with your eye. So if you see a bright light to the side, your eyes will immediately move to that light involuntarily and that's regulated by the superior colliculus versus if you hear something a loud sound your head immediately turns towards that sound and that's regulated by the inferior colliculus so this regulates visual and hearing movements uh, and kind of coordinates the eyes and the ears to sounds out in the environment uh, so those are the colliculi and they're found in the tectum the back side of the midbrain um, so the inferior colliculi are really involved in what's called the startle reflex. When you hear a loud sound, your body suddenly jumps and you look over to where that sound was. That's regulated by the inferior colliculus. People that have damage to these regions, like from a stroke, lose those functions. So they no longer have a startle reflex or uh, they can't uh, control, they can't regulate their, uh, they don't automatically turn towards lights and things like that when they see them. So that's the tectum. Uh, the tegmentum is the floor of the midbrain. And um, it contains, so this is again, you kind of think of it as sort of sandwiched between the, uh, the cerebral peduncles here and the tectum. But this region in red here, up above, this is all the tegmentum. And it contains a couple of really important structures. One is this band, it looks very dark, called the substantia nigra. Um, and the substantia nigra is very high in melanin, that's why it looks dark. But it often, uh, it also contains neurons that secrete uh, dopamine and norepinephrine. In fact, melanin is derived from these. Um, so dopamine, dopaminergic neurons, norepinephrine secreting neurons. And these dopaminergic neurons are going to actually send projections up from the substantia nigra through the midbrain to a region in the lower part of the cerebrum called the basal ganglia. And this is super important for regulating uh, conscious uh, and subconscious motor activities. So when you're with coordination and everything. Uh, also with motor planning, kind of how are we gonna, how am I gonna work through these sets of movements? And um, uh, addiction phenomena are involved with this as well. And uh, we'll explore this when we look at the limbic system and uh, the basal ganglia. Um, but specifically Parkinson's disease is due to a loss of dopamine secreting neurons from the substantia nigra. Um, so that's one really important uh, nucleus, you know, nucleus here in the midbrain.
We also have two cranial nerve nuclei, the ocular motor nerves uh, and the nuclei for the trochlear nerves, so cranial nerve number three and four. These, uh, the cranial nerve number three, provides motor impulses that also regulate the eyeball movement. So does number four, and remember number six does as well. So three, four, and six all regulate the movement of the muscles around the eyeball. So that turns the eyeball to different directions. Um, three though also has uh, uh, autonomic fibers that regulate pupillary constriction and uh, what's called accommodation, changing the shape of the lens to help focus near and far. So that's all regulated by cranial nerve number three. Uh, but both three and four, their nuclei begin in the uh, uh, midbrain here. And so if you look up at this picture, they've only labeled cranial nerve number four uh, here. So you see its nucleus here. Cranial nerve number three is kind of out to the side here. Okay, so that's the nuclei for uh, the cranial nerves in the midbrain. So the functions of the midbrain really, a uh, lot of eyeball coordination. So visual eye coordination and function, also coordination of hearing through the inferior colliculi, uh, different motor control, sleep-wake cycles, arousal alertness, and temperature regulation. Uh, we'll look at the sleep-wake here uh, in, in the next slide. So those are the main structures in the midbrain. So I mentioned along the back side of the brain stem is where all your ascending sensory fibers come up from the spinal cord. Um, and there's a specific area that goes from the medulla through the pons into the midbrain, uh, particular groups of neurons, nuclei, and this is called the reticular activating system, RAS. And the RAS is important um, because essentially it is going to help filter a lot of the uh, stimuli coming from the body. It's also going to help with your sleep-wake cycles. Um, so its main functions is arousal, attention, alertness, and waking from sleep. It's preventing sensory overload from all those inputs coming from the body, uh, and hopefully should filter out insignificant stimuli. Um, the sleep is associated with essentially inactivation of the RAS. So melatonin, amongst other things, shuts down the reticular activating system and you go to sleep. When the RAS activates, you wake up again. Um, coma actually can come about from damage to the reticular activating system. So you still have brainstem function, but your higher cognitive centers are all offline. So think of this almost like the neurons here and their activities raying out to different parts of the brain, essentially activating it, turning on consciousness and so forth. Um, there's also regulation of skeletal muscle activity and muscle tone and uh, so forth. Um, usually visual, auditory, vibration, pain stimuli will all activate the RAS. So when you are in pain or you have some novel stimulus that comes in, your RAS activates. You become more alert, more conscious. Um, usually smell does not activate because smell is working on a higher region, the limbic system. It kind of bypasses the brainstem. Um, but most of your typical sensory stimuli will activate the reticular activating system. So this is important because again, it's involved in maintaining wakeful consciousness. Uh, I should say it uses a variety of different neurotransmitters. Serotonin is a big one, but there's a number of different neurotransmitters used here in the RAS. And last but not least here, we come to the cerebellum. This is the second largest portion of the brain. It's about a 10th of the mass of the whole brain. Uh, but it contains about 50% of all the neurons in the brain, so hugely densely packed full of neurons. Um, we're not going to look at the in-depth structure of the cerebellar neurons. There's a lot of information available on the web and in textbooks to go through that. I don't think we need that level of detail. Um, but think of this as kind of your re major regulatory center for uh, unconscious motor activities. So things you don't need to consciously think about doing, like riding a bike, playing the piano or so forth once you've mastered it um, or learned a certain amount of skill, uh, that's where the cere cerebellum takes over. Uh, the transverse fissure separates the cerebellum from the cerebrum and there is a, a dura fold there, the falx cerebelli, and that essentially is going to separate the cerebellum from the, um, uh, from the cerebrum. And um, I mentioned before that uh, another name for that is the tentorium cerebelli. And we often talk about conditions be there being either super tentorial, in other words, above the level essentially of the brainstem and the cerebrum, 
or a subtentorial, which would affect the brainstem and the cerebrum. So we'll, we'll maybe see that term in the neurology section. There are two cerebral hemispheres, just like there are two, or cerebellar hemispheres, I'm sorry, just like there are two cerebral hemispheres, and they're connected in the middle by a structure called the vermis or worm. It looks kind of worm-like. Um, and there's an anterior, posterior lobe. Uh, there's also something called the flocular nodular lobe at the base down here. Um, and um, so that is the kind of general structure. It's kind of mimicking the overall structure of the cerebrum but on a smaller scale. The cortex of the cerebellum is different than the cortex of the cerebrum. Uh, it has less surface area. There are fewer folds, uh, fewer convolutions, and so forth. And if you look inside, there's a branching arrangement of white matter, and that's called the arbor vitae. Um, so you see essentially this very strong white matter uh, arbor vitae kind of grapevine inside. You see that here. And that is really all of the myelinated fibers connecting the uh, major motor neurons inside of the cerebellum uh, with the brainstem. And again, the brainstem is connected via the cerebellar peduncles. So there's a superior, middle, and inferior cerebellar peduncle. And this is where the, um, the midbrain and the pons and the medulla are all connected uh, with transverse fibers going back and forth. Um, deep within the white matter, um, there are nuclei of all the axons that are going to be carrying impulses from the cerebellum to the brain centers. So cortex a little bit different than in the uh, cerebrum. The functions of the cerebellum, this is a major motor area of the brain. It's going to mediate your subconscious contractions of skeletal muscle necessary for essentially coordination, posture, and balance. So just the ability to walk straight down the room, assuming you have an intact vestibular apparatus in your inner ear, which regulates balance, uh, this is regulated through the cerebellum. Cerebellum also allows you to do very rapid movements like you know, touch your nose with your finger and then remove it and do it again and again and again, or to try to touch if someone puts out their finger and you try to touch it. Um, all of that's regulated through the cerebellum. Um, and it helps to produce smooth instead of jerky or trembling movements. Um, helps regulate walking, running, riding posture. Um, and it's going to integrate with information coming from the inner ear um, and from the proprioceptors in your body. Those three, the uh, proprioceptors in the body, the inner ear, and the cerebellum are all going to regulate balance, finally. Um, and as we'll see in the clinical section, you actually need two out of those three to have proper balance. So if you have uh, you know, damage to the cerebellum and also have damage to maybe proprioceptors. Um, you're, even though you have an in intact vestibular apparatus, you'll still have difficulty standing and so forth. Um, okay, so that's a little on the cerebellum and that wraps it up for the uh, brainstem section. Um, I should say one thing, more thing about the cerebellum. It's recently it just came out in the news that there's another function and that has to do with learning and even addiction. Um, so the cerebellum is probably a lot more complicated than we think, um, but we usually think of it mostly as a motor sort of coordination system. Um, all right, so that's going to wrap it up for the brainstem and the major features of the brainstem. So just remember that there is essentially primary descending motor fibers, ascending sensory fibers, and then these various cranial nerve nuclei. Ten out of the twelve cranial nerves originate in the uh, brainstem four in the medulla, four in the pons, two in the midbrain. And then uh, we have a number of other regulatory centers for uh, cardiovascular and respiratory and then some digestive functions and so forth. So that is the brainstem or uh, the R-complex.